بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلاما على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الأنبياء وعلى آله الأسكياء وأصحابه الأتقياء أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وهل جزاء الإحسان إلا الإحسان صدق الله العظيم When we open the Quran and read the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what we learn is that again and again in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs us to be good people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is encouraging us to build within ourselves good characteristics. For us to build a good connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also with the creation. That's why you notice one thing that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the companions who participated in the battle of Badr, his praise of them was not that they had strength or they had great stamina or that they were agile or that they could continue to fight and they had the greatest warrior skills that any warrior had ever had in the history of mankind. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He praises the companions who participated in the battle of Badr. And remember one thing, after the prophets, the rank belongs to those companions who participated in the battle of Badr. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the narration of Hatib bin Abi Balta and his story, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, those who participated in the battle of Badr are forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now when Allah describes them and highlights their characteristics that made them successful, what does Allah say? This is very interesting. Allah says in Surah Al-Anfal, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ حَقًّا لَهُمْ دَرَجَاتٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ وَرِزْقٌ كَرِيمٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these were five characteristics that made them special. That they were those that when they heard the name of Allah, their hearts would tremble. When the verses of the Qur'an were recited to them, إِذَا تُلِتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا Their faith would increase. عَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ They relied on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But along with that internal development of theirs, they didn't leave aside their deen. الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ And when a person makes something good out of themselves, when a person develops, when a person becomes something of substance, then what they do to people also has a substantial impact. But from within, if we are hollow and if we don't develop ourselves, the words that we say will fall on deaf ears. They'll, they'll echo within the walls of our rooms, but they won't spread through the world. And the Prophet ﷺ is, is, is a beautiful example of this. That the Prophet ﷺ, he himself makes something out of himself. And he brings the companions and makes something out of them. So the Prophet ﷺ is teaching the companions to be good and to also do good. That your good doesn't only stay with you and doesn't leave with you. Rather, whatever good you've built, you now bring that to other people. You help better other people. The Prophet ﷺ wasn't selfish. His concern was for everyone. Therefore, we have examples of him standing through the night, praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, crying out, Ya Allah, have mercy on the ummah. Ya Allah, forgive them. Ya Allah, grant them Jannah. There are narrations that tell us the Prophet ﷺ would sacrifice animals on behalf of his ummah. So when you look at the campaign of the Prophet ﷺ in his da'wah, what you learn is that where he was making dua for the ummah, it's in its place. Where the Prophet ﷺ was giving his lectures, that's also in its place. But one of the most powerful tools the Prophet ﷺ used to win the hearts of the people around him, to win the hearts of the Islamophobes, and yes, I said that correctly, Islamophobia is not something new, it's not a new phenomenon. It existed from the time of the Prophet ﷺ. After the first revelation, people started speak, speaking bad things about the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ, he was affected by their words. He was a human being, he had emotions. And just as today when we as Muslims walk around in, the, in, in our country or drive around in these streets, we notice that sometimes people look at us, people may say certain things, whether it's to us or our women who may cover up, or our children, or whatever the case may be. And when they're saying things, it affects us. The Prophet ﷺ was also affected by their words. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals a surah in the Quran to come and console the Prophet. ﷺ. Allah says, Noon wal qalami wa ma yasturun. Allah takes an oath by the pen and what they write, meaning what the people were saying about the Prophet. ﷺ. Ma anta bi ni'mati rabbika bi majnoon. They can call you insane all their life, but that doesn't that doesn't bring insanity to you. You are protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The people in the world can say whatever they want to. But the truth is that their words don't change the reality. 
And remember that for every word they say, you are rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is your coping mechanism. How do you retaliate to someone who's being harsh to you? Show them your great character. Very soon they will see and you will see the outcome of what happened in this world. Who was wrong? Allah knows of the one who is led further astray than the other. Allah knows those who are guided. Now why do I talk about all of this? The reason why we bring this up is because the Capitol Hill shooting is no secret to any person. And I'm not sit here to rise emotions and tell people that we need to take arms. And the political movements that are happening are, with regards to this are happening. But right now what we need to do is focus and ask ourselves, what is one of the most powerful lessons that we take back? What's one of the most powerful lessons for me? Is that there is a man and a lady and her sister. A man and his wife and his sister who are all three younger than me. They're all three younger than me. Not only that, I've been to their house. I've spent a night at their house. Their father hosted me. Their brother hosted me. I spent, night, I spent a whole day with that brother. And after being at the house and seeing them, I always, since I heard the shooting, I thought to myself, what makes him so special? What makes this person so special? You know, an average young man who, who grew up here, who, who was an average young man who played sports here, an average young man who had an average wedding, like every person has a wedding, a person who went to college, a person who was at his degree, and an average person, what makes him special? Why is it that when he passes away, the president of Turkey is coming to intervene on his behalf that there should be something done about this person's death. Why is it that Muslims across the country are gathering together and they're remembering this person? And Khatib today across this country are remembering this person. Not only him, but his wife and her sister. What makes these people special is that they did something in their life that was a secret between, between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was something they did, there was something they did that we are unaware of. Because the greatest man in Islamic history, their goods came out after they passed away. After the Prophet ﷺ passed away is when the Sahaba went to the Prophet ﷺ's wife Aisha radiallahu anha and they asked her, tell us about the Prophet ﷺ. And she said, Kana khulquhu al -Quran. That's who the Prophet ﷺ was. After the Prophet ﷺ passed away is when the Sahaba sat together and they started remembering those moments they had with the Prophet ﷺ. And many things that they knew of, that they had seen, that they had witnessed, had now come together in the collection of hadith. And that's why when we sit here and read the life of the Prophet ﷺ, it really, it makes, it really shakes our heart. Just right now before I came I was reading hadith and I came across a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Abu Hurairah radiallahu an passed by a, a group of people and they had a roasted animal they were eating. They had a barbecue going on and one person invited Abu Hurairah radiallahu an said, why don't you come and join us in the food? And Abu Hurairah radiallahu an said, how can I have this meal with you when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't even eat bread till his full his entire life? He's remembering the moment of the Prophet ﷺ when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in the Quran, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَفَا That you were instructed by Allah to do good. But your ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it needs to be mukhlis. It needs to be solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Always have something between yourself and Allah that is a secret between yourself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's when your work will mean something, not only while you live, but after you leave on. There are some people, they have sincerity in their actions. Their actions in number wise may be the same or maybe even less than what we do. But the few actions they've done, whether it's a lot or a little, it has a lot of weight. You know, I remember when we were students in Madrasa, we came across the last hadith of, uh, of Sahih al-Bukhari. And, uh, and the, the, the last hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, the chapter of it is that um, Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi, he is debating against certain people who have deviant beliefs. And he, he establishes a point that, that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will weigh our deeds. He will weigh our deeds. So, it, and this is proven in the Quran again and again, man man the one whose scale is heavy, the one whose scale is light. So I remember our teacher asking us this, that why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will weigh our deeds? On the other hand, throughout the Quran and throughout the hadith, we hear Allah and the Rasul talking about numbers. Man ja'a bin hasanati falahu ashru If you do one good, one, one good deed, you get 10 times a reward. Or for example, if you do this particular deed, you get so many hundreds of reward, or so many thousands of reward. We're all aware of this, right? So in the hadith and Quran, you find our deeds being counted as numbers, but on the day of judgment, Allah is going to weigh them. If something is counted in numbers, the way you find the result is by counting the number. And that's how you get the result. 
and something that isn't counted in number, that's when you weigh them. So I pay you for a kilo of apples. It doesn't matter how many are in there, as long as there's a kilo, I, get my, I pay you, you give me my product. So he said that there seems to be a contradiction here, that Allah is saying that he's going to weigh our deeds, and the Prophet wasallam again and again is telling us that there is a number put to our deeds. So then he explained, he said to us, go and think about it. The next day we came to class and every person gave their understanding of why there was a, 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 an apparent a misunderstanding. So our teacher at the end of it said the reason is because a person can do a lot of deeds and build up high numbers, but there may be another person who only does one deed. But that one deed has a special characteristic called ikhlas, and that sincerity is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will weigh, and it will outweigh everything else he's done in his life. This one deed sometimes with ikhlas can change your life. You know, there's a narration of Abu, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anh. He says, one night I woke up in the middle of the night. He was just sleeping, he woke up. And he said, I came into the streets of Medina Munawwara and I was strolling, I was taking a walk. And while I was walking, I saw in front of me was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So he thought to himself that let me go and walk with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But then the thought crossed his mind, maybe why the Prophet is walking alone is because he wants to be alone. So he very silently was shadowing, was following the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa while he's secretly walking behind the Prophet ﷺ, at one point the Prophet ﷺ realized someone was behind him. So the Prophet stopped, he turned around and he said, Man al-Rajul, who's there? So Abu Dhar al-Ghifari came out, he said, Ana Abu Dhar, O Messenger of Allah, I am Abu Dhar. The Prophet ﷺ said, what do you want? He said, O Messenger of Allah, I just want to walk with you. The Prophet said, let's walk. And they continued walking until they came in front of this mountain. And the Prophet Sallallahu pointed at that mountain and said, if Allah gave me wealth equivalent to this mountain, you know wealth equivalent to a mountain is in the billions. If Allah gave me wealth equivalent to this mountain, I wouldn't spend a penny on myself, I would distribute it all amongst the poor people. What a statement. You know, if someone was to give me a billion dollars, my clothes would change, my car would change, everything about me would change. And the Prophet is saying that I wouldn't use a penny for myself, all of it would go to the masakeen. Then after that, the Prophet ﷺ said, المكثرون هم المقللون يوم القيامة Those who have a lot of wealth in this world, they will desire that they only had a little in the hereafter. They continued walking, and as they continued walking, the Prophet ﷺ, he told Abu Dhar, stay right here and don't move. So Abu Dhar sat down. He said, I saw the Prophet walk off into the night, and he was gone, I couldn't see him anymore. A little while later, the Prophet ﷺ came back. Abu Dhar asked, O Messenger of Allah, when you were gone, I heard some noise. What was that noise? The Prophet ﷺ says, that was Jibreel who came to me. And Jibreel ﷺ just said to me, whoever says, La ilaha illallah will go to Jannah. And Abu Dhar is shocked, what? Whoever says, La ilaha illallah is going to go to Jannah? What about all the sins that we did, all the wrong that we did? So he asked the Prophet of Allah, Wa in zana, wa in saraqa, even if he did zina, even if he stole, the Prophet said, Wa in zana, wa in saraqa. Even if he did zina, even if he stole, as long as he says, La ilaha illallah, he really meant it. As long as it was a pillar in his, in his life, and he knew that was one thing that really mattered to him. And then at the end of it, the Prophet wasallam he repeated this a few times, and then at the end, he told Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu an, ala raghmi anfi Abi Dhar. Even if Abu Dhar wants to be a barrier between that person and Jannah, Allah is still going to give that person Jannah. Now why do I share this? The reason why I share this is because it's important every individual sitting here, you ask yourself until today, what have I done? What is my legacy? What have I built for myself? And the three, these three young people who passed away this week, the truth is that they were young. You know, they were young, they hadn't even reached their full blossoming age yet. Just married six weeks ago. You know, that thought just crosses my mind again and again, and I think to myself, just six weeks ago, they stood at their child's nikah, and six weeks later, they're standing at their qabr. Right? Six weeks later, they're standing at their qabr. In six weeks, you haven't even figured out how much you love your spouse. In six weeks, you haven't even realized what their favorite ice cream is. In six weeks, you're still developing that relationship. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides for certain people that living in the world is a sijin, it's a, it's a prison. And for you, the jannah is the hereafter. And that's a lot better for you. And a person being killed like this, a person being executed like this, is nothing less than shahada itself. It's martyrdom given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we sit here and look at them, the thought shouldn't be how sad it is, and how sad they are, how unlucky they are. They're not unlucky. They're very lucky. We are unlucky that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't honor us in their shoes. And that's why we continue to pray to Allah, Ya Allah, Allahumma rzuqna shahadatan fi sabirik. Oh Allah, give us all shahada in your pathway. Warzuqna, uh, warzuqna, um, 
Umar radiallahu anhu's dua, I'm forgetting the last part of the dua. He says, Oh Allah, wajal mauti fi baladi habibi. Yes, this is, these were his words. He said, Oh Allah, give me martyrdom in your pathway and make my death in the city of your beloved Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I, I, I want to come back to, again, just uh, the, the three young people who passed away in their lives, you know, just so that we can relate to them. Average young people going to school and they were successful, mashallah. People who left, who are going to build a legacy going to dental school, just accepted to dental school, and then another career on the other side for the, for the sister, and then, you know, working within the community, making an impact locally, you know, raising funds for international orphans and young and poor people across the world, and making sure that they have dental care and that they can smile. Where do you find people like this? We need more people like this. When one leaves, a hundred more need to come. That's why they used to say that if you kill one Muslim, another hundred will come. If you kill one Salahuddin, another hundred will come, inshaAllah, Aziz. So the same thing here, when one person leaves the world, we can't sit back here and say, man, that was a sad story. You have to ask yourself, what do I take from that person's legacy? If you dedicate yourself, if you dedicate your life in this world to do good things, when you die, people will stand there to praise you. But if you don't dedicate your life to do much in this world, when you die, it's very possible there will be no one there to praise you. Now you're probably wondering, what does praise have to do with anything? There's a very beautiful hadith that Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi quotes in his sahih. Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi quotes this hadith in his sahih. It is narrated by Abu al-Aswad radiallahu an. Abu al-Aswad says, I came to Medina Munawwara and I met Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an. I was sitting with him. While we were sitting together, a funeral passed by, right? The deceased passed by, the, the procession. And as it was passing by, the people were praising him. They were saying, so and so person was a good person. He did this, he did that, he did this, he did that. And then Umar radiallahu an said, he will certainly enter it. Now a little while later, Abu Laswat says, another procession passed by, and as it was passing by, the people were saying good things about him. That person did this good, he did that good, he was known for this, he was known for that. And then Umar an said, he will certainly enter it. A third procession passed by, when this procession passed by, Umar the, the people started saying, he was a bad person. He was known for backbiting, slandering, harming other people. He took their wealth and didn't pay it back. He was a wretched man. And then Umar an said, he will certainly enter it. So Abu Aswad, when he heard Umar an saying this, he said, what is this Umar? How could you say he will certainly enter into paradise? So he immediately interjected. So Umar an said, one day we were with the Prophet And the Prophet told us that when a person passes away and four people praise him for good, Allah will give him Jannah. And then we asked our Messenger of Allah, what if it's only three people? The Prophet said, even if three people praise a person after he passes away with good deeds of his, Allah will give him Jannah. And the Sahaba asked the Messenger of Allah, what if it's two people? The Prophet ﷺ said, even if two people praise a person with good after he passes away, he will go to Jannah. And Umar says, we should have asked him about one. But we stopped right there. We didn't continue after that. And it, it reminds us of the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, where the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تسب الأموات فإنهم قد أفضوا إلى ما قدموا. Do not speak ill about those who have passed away. No matter how hard you had a living between yourself, because in this world there are circumstances, everyone has weaknesses, we're all a target of shaitan. People can't be who they are because of the constant effect that shaitan is having on us. So when a person passes away, leave it at that. Learn to forgive each other, learn to forget about what happened, and make dua for each other. Because in the dear hereafter, you don't want your dua to be a reason why someone can't go to Jannah, because it's possible someone may say the very same thing about you. Someone may come and say the very same thing about you. So in summary, what we learn from this is that great people do good things and they leave a great legacy behind. Every person sitting here has a potential to be a great person. Don't think about the person in front of you or next to you or the khatib speaking to you. I don't know what my legacy is. You don't know what your legacy is. But you have to build a legacy to have one. And that legacy isn't for self-praise or for gloating. It's so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happy with us. And the last two things I want to mention, that at a time like this where we're hearing all these stories, especially with the shooting in a, of the Somali brother and also the shooting in Canada that happened in the past few days, so much is happening. It reminds us again the importance of reading our du'as every morning. You know, every morning when you wake up, before you leave the house, the adults sitting here, train our kids. Especially at this time, there's a lot of tension. It's important that we protect ourselves with du'as. Reading your mu'awwadatayn, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقُ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ And blowing it over yourselves. For example, giving sadaqah before you leave the house. This is very serious and it's very important right now. As you're all making protection for yourself, someone might think they want to sign up to a gym so they can build some guns, some guns, right? And, and protect themselves from any attacker. You also want to make sure you protect yourself with du'a. 
Another very powerful dua to read is Ayatul Kursi before you leave the house. Another very important dua to read when you leave the house is Bismillahilladhi la yadurru ma'a ismihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fil sama wa huwa samiul alim. Before you leave the house, make a habit of giving sadaqa. These are things to protect yourself. But along with the dua, we must also take the asbab as well, take the means as well. If you have children, you have young ones, the adults, this may be a good time for you to be with them. Drive them to, drive them back. Make sure people are traveling in groups. And no person sitting here needs to get emotional and decide to retaliate to what happened and start doing some silly things. We don't need any more nutcases, right? The media is already making it sound like the whole ummah is a nutcase and we're not. So it's time for us to retaliate the way Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted us to retaliate. So we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us all the tawfiq and ability to live the life of pious, to die with the pious, to be resurrected with the pious. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows every person sitting here to leave behind a legacy that will be an inspiration for the next generation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, our, our spouses, our children and our family from any evil that is coming towards them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our masajid, protect our countries, protect our lands, protect our homes. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah alladhi la yurja li kashf al-shada'idhi illa hu. Wa la yuda'a li dafi al-masa'ibi illa hu. Wa ma talab al-wasilina fi al-kawnayn illa hu. Wa ma murad al-ashiqin fi al-darayn illa hu. Al-nasu kulluhum fuqara'u wa la ghaniya illa hu. Al-nasu kulluhum dhu'afa'u wa la qawiyya illa hu. La khaliqa wa la malika wa la nasira illa hu. هل من خالق غير الله يرزقكم من السماء والأرض لا إله إلا هو ونشهد أن لا إله إلا هو ونشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وسندنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أرحم أمتي بأمتي أبو بكر وأشدهم في أمر الله عمر وأصدقهم حياء عثمان وأقضاهم علي رضوان الله تعالى عليه مجمعين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما يا رب العالمين اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما أعطيت وقنا واصرف عنا برحمتك شر ما قضيت فإنك تقضي بالحق ولا يقضى عليك إنه لا يذل من واليت ولا يعز من عاديت تباركت ربنا وتعاليت فلك الحمد على ما قضيت ولك الشكر على ما أنعمت به وأليت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم انصر المسلمين في كل زمان ومكان يا رب العالمين اللهم احفظ البلاد المسلمين واحفظ الحرمين الشريفين والمجد الأقصى يا رب العالمين اللهم ولي أمورنا خيارنا ولا تولي أمورنا شرارنا اللهم إنا نسألك من خير ما سألك منه نبيك وحبيبك سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ونعوذ بك من شر ما استعاذ منه نبيك وحبيبك سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أنت المستعان وعليك البلاغ ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم صلى الله تعالى على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه اجمعين برحمتك يا رحمة الرحمين والحمد لله رب العالمين أقم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر شهد أن لا إله إلا الله شهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة